Hello, and welcome to Face the Podcast, the podcast for family and children's entertainers, where we find out all about different entertainers, who they are, what they do, and how they do it. My name is Gordon Drayson, and I am a full-time children's entertainer and also your host. If you are new here or you haven't yet done so, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe. We're on YouTube. You can like and subscribe. Press the little bell icon to make sure you're alerted every time there's a new podcast released. Or if you listen to the podcast on, on whatever platform you use, please make sure to leave a comment or subscribe to that so once again you are alerted every time a new episode is released. This episode is slightly different because it's someone that you probably haven't heard of. Kerry J is our guest for today and she has a wealth of entertainment, knowledge and experience. Although she's come to children and family entertainment in a slightly different way to most of us. We'll hear all about her story coming up. So without further ado, let's get straight into it and talk to our guest today, Kerry J. So, hello, Kerry J. Welcome to Face the Podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> well, it's lovely to have you. And you have a very different story to all of the other um, entertainers and family entertainers that we've had on this series so far so for those people who haven't yet uh, heard of Kerry J uh, can you give us just a, a brief overview of who Kerry J is ah. <laughs> in a nutshell um I don't know really um so I've been um, in the entertainment industry pretty much all my life um started off with talent competitions and things as a kid um, always dancing and singing and everything like that um went into um sort of uh, show bit shows really summer season panto early on um i was a dancer um for majority of my life and then things changed when children came along um and moved more into the kids' entertainment side of things in recent years, but it's been a fairly recent thing. Um, but so my kids are now 13 and 15, the boys. Um, so I, the, the children's entertainment side of things really been to work around them. It was a job that fitted around all of their schedules, school runs and things like that, I think had they not come along or I, I had schedule's been easier i might have opened up a dance school or something like that but i think because my partner their dad um, my kid's dad has a very sporadic work life with shift patterns it was never going to work to be able to do anything normal around the child care so it this sort of thing has worked quite well just kind of creating my own hours and working around them really OK, so so let's go right the way back then. And let's just um, let's start at the beginning, as it were. A very good place to start. Oh, there was a, there you go, was a, <laughs> a hint of what's to come, because um, uh, for those of you who don't know, Kerry J is uh, a, a, a West End star. We've got a West End star on our podcast today. <laughs> it's just amazing. So let's go. Let's go to before that. Um, you said you did lots of talent competitions and things. Is this sort of. Uh, your parents pushing you to do this or is this something that you actually wanted to do yourself? I think you couldn't stop me really. <laughs> it's like every obnoxious stage schooly kid that just wouldn't shut up and stop kicking her legs around. Um, yeah, me and my sister used to have a sister act, <laughs> very old school, um, going around the, the holiday camps. Um, and you know that was our that was our summer holiday. Really, you'd, you'd win the the competition in the little. Um, holiday camp you'd go on to do the grand final and it was nice because you'd meet the same families year after year um in in the final they used to have in Weymouth and it was all always over Halloween so it was you know back in the 80s Halloween was the smell of bin bags and I'm instantly transported back there <laughs> it wasn't your shop bought costumes it was bin bags galore <laughs> um but yeah me and my sister ended up winning the grand final one year which it was fantastic. Congratulations. Um, 
<laughs> oh, we had a great little, we did a ballad. I think, we, in fact, um, what did we sing? Truly scrumptious. Ah, and then Banana Rama style. Oh, yes. But Banana Rama spell whipped off the dresses, sparkly leotards underneath, and did a tap dance to Ugly Bug Ball. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Fabulous. So it's, it's really funny you, you talk about the holiday parks because I had experience both on that side of it by doing the talent competitions as a as a children's entertainer but mm -hmm. i was also a blue coat at one point for right. Hayden warner so uh, one of my tasks every week was to do the uh, talent competition and oh honestly some of the kids really did not want to be there they were they had these really really pushy parents who were which is why i had my question at the beginning they had these pushy I... parents that were going come on sing up sing up i've just recently watched the yeah, original <laughs> yeah. well, exactly i've just watched the original gypsy um and um just, so i was just, in that with ruth maddock actually ago. when i was yeah. a little um i was a child when ruth maddock was uh, mama rose right um, it was a, the UK tour of that, so I was one of the little leads in that, which was so you, great. You, you didn't have to say, hello, my name's Gary, what's Louise. yours? <laughs> 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 I so, don't know. I mean, I don't know. People say about these virtuosos and these, you know, incredible violinists and, oh, God, their parents have forced them to do it from an early age. Having two kids myself now, there is no way you can force a kid to do something it doesn't want to do. Absolutely no way. I've, there needs to be I've some tried. sort of um, inclination with them, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, you know, I've I've tried everything to get my kids into doing their piano practice, and so there's just no way it's gonna. I, I finally gave up on my son when he ran into the road in his socks to escape piano lesson. I, okay, I admit defeat. <laughs> sort of making a bit of a statement there, isn't he? <laughs> what can you do? I don't want you to get run over, so I tell you what, let's stop piano. But yeah, so I, I went on a um, I I. I went to stage school so i went to Leighton theater arts at 16 so i left home moved to london um well sorry <laughs> it felt like london it was sort of, yeah 49 so um yeah so moved out of home when i was 16 to go to um to theater college um so did my three years there um actually kind of wasn't sure at that point i was a bit overwhelmed i think by all the super sparkly perfect hair and makeup the it was it was a bit big wide world at 16 to be moving into coming from a family where you know we cut corners and we didn't really wear makeup and we you know it wasn't to the very very shiny people at stage school it, um, so I ended up actually doing A levels at night school, um, and then going off to university for a year to do sports science because <laughs> right. it was the only course of science that they'd take me on to because I kind of blagged my way into the course somehow. <laughs> um, but because I think I chose a London university, so I went to um, Roehampton Institute, which was part of the University of Surrey, but it was in Wandsworth. Um, so I started, I had a brilliant time, met some awesome people, real student life, but started buying the stage newspaper, which at the time was where all the auditions were. Um, so just kind of, oh, maybe uh, it's a free dance class if I pop along to this audition. And um, yeah, so I ended up um, getting a contract on a cruise ship um about after about eight months or so so, so was, when this, I was that, this a dream when you were when you when you went to lanes the dream was to be a dancer and an entertainer the, the dream was to be at west end and i i actually started going to auditions while i was at lane um and i did get down to the very last few for the first cast of sunset boulevard um but didn't quite get it ah. um I think because I was only 17 at the time, I was I shouldn't have really been going, you know, meant to go to auditions. So probably they figured plenty of time. And I I don't know. I I love, love musicals. I love performing. I don't so much love all the showy backstage stuff sometimes. I think there's a niche of people you... Yeah, I think it, especially at that age, kind of 16 to 18, you, you're finding your crowd, aren't you? You're establishing yourself, yeah. trying to work out who you are. And, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And who you want to be, even more important. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah.
So you got a, uh, a, a cruise ship um, contract. Now, again, a lot of entertainers uh, will, will know what that's like because they'll have uh. had, uh, you know, cruise ship contracts before, but not the same because when we go on as entertainers, we're normally either a single or a double act. And so we are, you know, we're going to be sort of on our own a lot. And there's an awful lot of magicians and entertainers who have done the cruise ships and they've just, you know, done one of two things. They've either just saved all the money that they earn so that when they get back, they can just buy a house. And, you know, that part of life is done uh, and then they're a bit more stable. And the other side of it is to, to, to teach yourself a skill. I know that we've got um, Russ Stevens, who did a lot of cruise ships, big illusionist, and he taught himself how to edit video in right. his downtime, of which there's yeah. a lot of it. Uh, and so he, he sort of gave himself a new skill during that time. But your, your, your sort of um, experience is going to be slightly different, I'm guessing, because you're with a dance troupe, right? So you're doing shows probably a lot more than we are, and the same shows over and over for different audiences. I think it's probably a very similar experience. You're, you're stuck in a one place. It depends. A lot of magicians, I think, will go on to do a two-week kind of contract or a one cruise, and then they'll come off and then they'll go, you are on the one ship with your little cabin and you are there for a six-month contract. Um, but I think generally it's pretty similar experience you I, I hang out with the musicians a lot I was I was learning loads about jazz and and just I took my guitar and I was you know improving on skills like that so that was good fun just getting really learning to listen and I think I was uh, getting really into Joni Mitchell and Jock of Astorius at the time and then the bass player played me what you know I was reading about and uh, we, we were just bouncing just jamming cabins really it was yeah. yeah it was a nice time it was it was a nice six months i probably had enough by the end of six months and you save like you say you save loads and that was brilliant um managing to save a bit of money come yeah. back and, um, it's a bit like university but being paid to do it isn't it because well, you, yeah you've got the social <laughs> life there as well yeah, but... oh yeah definitely social life yeah so did you um did you sort of speak with any of the special acts as they came on or were they sort of separate from where you were um it was i can't really remember it was a while ago probably yeah uh, but not, they would have been on believe. when you had nights off i guess or or if there's more than one venue you'd be in a different venue so yeah not not so much i don't think they they hang out quite so much at the time um but yeah i don't remember any magicians or jugglers or anything like that at the time but yeah, but saying that I did a lot of um, summer season and panto. So while I was actually at college, because um, I lived in Clacton, which is a seaside town, there used to be the you know the end of the pier kind of summer season. So I'd been doing summer seasons and and pantos in I mean my kind of off time at college. So I, I learned a lot, I think, of the skills there from the other acts. So it was it was a real old school summer season in that. The comedian would always end with a song. There was a certain way of doing things. You had the sketches in between the dance numbers, in between, you know, the twirlies and the turns. And the, it was it was that real last old school way of doing summer season. And I think I learned a lot from the other acts on that because they were, I mean, some of those comedians had been doing the same act for like 40 years, you know, it was, <laughs> but, but really honed their craft. Oh mean. yeah, they know everything okay. about that, right? They know exactly where the oh. laughs are happening, and oh, if they're yeah. not, what to do to forget them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. amazing. Yeah, so that was. Good so you're time. you're you're learning all these skills. You're you've been to college, you've been to university. You're learning everything you can about the entertainment industry, and your dream is to be a West End star. So, hey. <laughs> what, what what did you do to make that happen? Um. I, I think I struggled initially. I, I didn't have an agent or I had a lot. I, I, as I say, I, was, um, I went back to kind of, in fact, I came back to London again, having a university in London, having a place to stay in London was a godsend. And even though I wasn't still at the university, I had some very good friends who were and some nice couches to sleep on. So I could go and hang in London and go to auditions. Um, and I got into more of the kind of um, 
commercial side of it so pop videos modeling um they used a lot of on fashion shows they and they'd have a lot of proper models and dancer models <laughs> so i was one of the dancer models um and um and yeah all the the commercials so all the sort of yeah lot pop videos was a big business at the time for dancers so i did all of that so what, what um, would we have seen and, you in what can we go look up and find oh, a young <laughs> Kerry J in. I don't know. Um, sort of, <laughs> uh, the blue one with Elton John. Um, there okay. was a Brian Adams one. There was a some are better than others. I'm not quite sure which to recommend. <laughs> but you know, it was, it was an S Club Seven one at the time as well. That was a few different Amazing. ones. Amazing, living the life, huh? <laughs> no, it was good fun. But uh, yeah, eventually, just. Um, yeah, went along to an audition for Chicago, actually, and got, well, ended up getting it, which was brilliant. I, I it was, That was the dream. So, yeah. Chicago is a great yeah. show. It was a fabulous show, and it was so wonderful. I joined the cast as Sasha Distel was um, the lead in it, and wow, I mean, that's he's a legend. Mm. And, and because they tended to have, you had the same cast for a year, um, but then all the celebrities were on a kind of six weeks, maybe four, three or four month contract. So went through loads of really, really cool people coming through. Um, and then after a year, I was asked to stay on and then take on the first cover for Roxy. So I was um, first, who's, who's the female lead. And so uh, every time, so example, it's Denise Van Outen um, coming in. So if she was off sick, I was I was on, um, which, which is brilliant. Is that a quick phone call to your parents going, quick, quick, <laughs> yeah. come in now, I'm on. It really was, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they, yeah, mum used to run, so my mum's a dance teacher, she runs more, um, she used to teach Borum in Latin, and, but also more keep fit classes, was at the time I was doing that, and she said, I'll just stick a note, it was before social media, and before, you know, emailing everything, I'll just stick a note on the village hall, and I'll be there on the train. <laughs> they made it down amazing yeah it was, it was lovely to do it's a it's a gorgeous show um as much as anything you've each person each member of the cast is a is a character you all take a bow at the end it's not like your random chorus person yeah. you've got a character each one is of the merry murderesses has got a you know yeah. she's got a story even in the chorus so it was it was lovely to do and no costume changes you're there in your bra and knickers for two and a half hours so you'd have to faff around with costume and hair changes which you must have just experienced being well, a dame <laughs> well yes yeah we i had uh for those who are listening um in england in the uk we have something called pantomime which kerry mentioned earlier um and it's a show that's very unique to the uk and we have the principal boy is played by a woman in, in normal. I was a dick once like, for Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> dick Whittington. Although that, that tradition is going. It's a real shame that they're putting boys in the principal boys part, which is just oh, wrong. Boy the principal, principal, principal boy. girl is a girl. And then you have this dame who is a man dressed up as a woman. And for the first time, uh, I've done Ugly Sister, which is a baddie. But for the first time this last Christmas, I was um, Aunt Sally uh, and we did Dick Whittington just as you mentioned there um and yeah i had like i think seven costume changes which was yeah just nuts yeah I, the only time i got to sit down was during the interval and even right. then i had to make sure that everything else was all in place it was madness but great great fun it, and again learning a lot learning lots and lots from working with another group of people uh, which is very different to what i do in my day job which is just you know working solo unless i'm doing my double act um but your your Chicago was this was this the one at the Adelphi? I want to say yeah. it was the, right. Yeah. Okay, so that yeah. um, that obviously then gave yeah. you a springboard because people were able to come and see you and could see what you could do. Yeah. So did you yeah, did you then have sort of roles rolling in? Um, well, I, I you know you got I got a better agent come in. I I think I went from there. Um, did a stint at the Royal Festival Hall with uh, Stephen Sondheim's Follies which was a lovely show to do because it, it's um, of those of you 
no, don't know Follies. It's it's about old showgirls looking back on their career. So you had all these incredible old older lady actors i mean people like i mean the older me was louise gold who um is one of the original muppets um characters you know she, she puppeteers and singers she's just an incredible woman um and then all these other old ladies some which were in carry on films some uh, you know just People, old ladies, some of them were in their 80s and doing tap dancing and uh, and, and just these stories they had to tell were, was really amazing. And you were the flashbacks? Yeah, so we were the flashbacks. We were the, so um, I was young Phyllis, who was looking, um, which were the two, there's two main girls. Um, um, so, but the costumes were all sponsored by Zorowski Crystals as well. Oh. Wow. So I was there on the dressing room floor looking for crystals. <laughs> and I made myself a few bracelets out of it. <laughs> but, um, Fantastic. Yeah. But actually, hang on a second. I think I've got, oh, there's a, there's a Chicago one, actually. It's me oh. and Denise Van Elton. <laughs> Lovely. Oh, yeah, that's my Chicago. It's me. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, here we go. I have one of those. Here's the poly. I've got costume. one of those flyers, the Chicago one. I've got oh, one of those. <laughs> yeah. That's oh, um, that's my costume on. So uh, you can see wow. how it's dripping crystals. It was, um, yeah, that really is amazing. Really yeah, that's me with the other girl. So, uh, yeah, real beautiful costumes on there. Yeah, amazing. Uh, the festival hall as well, which was which, which was is so a lovely. lovely. Venue. But, Full yeah. orchestra. It was it was a lovely show to do. Bit so. spoiled, really. Bit spoiled. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and it was it was a long enough cut. It wasn't too long either. It was only about three or four months long. So it wasn't long enough to kind of take for granted either. It was yeah. It was lovely. Um, well, I mean, yeah. I could talk with you all day about musicals because <laughs> I just love musicals. In fact, I'm going to see one tonight. Although I have no idea what it's like. Oh, what like. are you it's saying? <laughs> I've heard mixed reviews. Uh, it's uh, I Should Be So Lucky, which is the St Aiken and Waterman music with some sort of story put around it. I, and it's at the Wimbledon Theatre, which okay. is a lovely theatre. That's a really yeah. nice theatre. Um, but, yeah, we shall see how that is. That was a, that yeah. was a, a present. I, so. uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I, the, the one I went to do after that was We Will Rock You. And, again, it's one of these let's take pop songs and yeah. kind of shoehorn a plot around it. And Yeah, I'm not convinced yeah, they I'm work so well. No. I'm not sure if people go because they, they like the story. I think the answer is no. I think they go um, because they like and want to hear the music. And so it's just like yeah. a like a musical pop concert, effectively. Yeah. And I think, in yeah, fact, but Six is a bit like that. I love Six, but I feel that people go for the music rather than the than listening to the the actual yeah. lyrics and learning something about the Six Wives. I think they just go because they love the the look and the and yeah. the music. There's a bit of fluffy facts going on in there, yeah, isn't it? A little there? bit. <laughs> I do like it. I, I think it's a great show. But... but yeah, it's good songs. So you, yeah. you then moved to Les Miserables, you moved to Greece. No, Les Miserables when I was little. I was, I oh, was you one did? of the, yeah, ah. I was the first cast of that. So with the very, very first cast. So um, was that your was, first West End show? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was about nine, eight, yeah, it was about, no, nine or ten, something like that. And you were but, Cosette? Yeah. No, I was Eponine. Eponine. Um, doesn't get the song she's the understudy who doesn't actually get to sing but but you sort of because you're you have to get in it on the basis of that if Cosette wasn't on you could step into her shoes on that night right evenings. but it was it was lovely to do especially with uh, you know the incredible first yeah. cards and and the bug bit then I'm guessing Oh, I think it was long before that, really. <laughs> <laughs> I remember doing cartwheels up the aisle in um, <laughs> up the theatre in rehearsals. <laughs> like going Just right because you could. Like, yeah, <laughs> see if I can cartwheel all the way down from the top. <laughs> Fantastic. But, yeah, no, yeah, a few, a few other shows, which was nice. And then um, uh, Met a Boy. Was this around the time that you did Greece? Because that would be quite ironic. Yeah, uh, was it? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was after Greece. I think it was. It was. Okay. Then I was probably towards the end of 
Oh, I can't remember. We were rock you and might have been. I don't know. There was, but he was Kiwi, so I ended up moving out to New Zealand for a year, um, which was nice. It's it made a change. I think I'd. It was nice to have a little bit of a break at that stage and do a bit of travelling, and because I hadn't really done the independent explore the world thing. So I did a bit of traveling around it and I, I made sure that even though I went out to see who's now my kid's dad, <laughs> um, I didn't just stay with him. I did a bit of Malaysia and Thailand doing the whole, you know, exploring, worked a bit in Australia. And so I had a year out doing that and came back. And yeah, so I, I guess I was in my early 30s by then and and felt like having a family so that's when we um so that's when everything back. changed yeah. so you, you hung up your west end wig as it were yeah and... i didn't think i was going to i really genuinely didn't i thought we were going to stay in london i'd you know do car carry on somehow i don't know in my head i was going to have a baby and then go back to it but the reality a show is eight shows a week you you'd never do like um bedtime is such an bedtime story the bath time when you've got a little baby that's such an important time and you you couldn't do that and and also at the time I think I was eight months pregnant and then my partner got a job in Oxfordshire um so he works for Formula One so he's he was working at uh, McLaren which was doable from London but then he got a job up in Oxfordshire, a permanent job with Mercedes. So we moved out of town. I was very reluctant to move out of town. I didn't want to leave London. It's um, like the final. I knew it That's it, isn't we, it, if you move? We were looking, yeah, we were looking for somewhere to live. We were looking at sort of one and a half bedroom flats, not really any garden. And we've got a four bedroom house with a massive garden opposite the park. It's. I mean, yeah. now my 15-year-old hates me for moving. Why didn't you ever leave London? It's so cool. And that's, it's a place for, yeah, I don't know. Who knows if it was the right decision. But, but anyway, life, life changed. Babies come along um, and just needed a, a new, you, you know, you love the first couple of years and you're loving being a mum and all of that. But very soon, I think I needed to find me again. The call um, of the applause is pulling you back again, isn't it? I know. I know you change your nappy. Nobody can give you a round of applause back. Like, what, what and, am I and I've done it, and they should. <laughs> they should, definitely. I've done yes. it. <laughs> we'll be right back with Kerry after this notice from our sponsor. And today our sponsor is me. I run a company called Drayson Design, and Drayson Design do lots of different things. One of the things that they do is build websites and we specialize in websites for entertainers. If you are looking to make changes to your website or even if you don't have a website yet, then please get in contact. We can talk you through what you need, what your requirements are, and we're very customer focused. So we will look at your website and see if it's doing what you want it to do from your customer's point of view. It's all very well having a website that you like as an entertainer, but if your customers aren't looking at it and making contact with you, then it's a website that's not doing its job. You can see some examples of work that we have done and created for other entertainers if you look at draysondesign.com. That's spelt D-R-A-Y-S-O-N design.com and don't forget just get in contact and we can talk to you about your new website or an update to your existing website it costs nothing to talk to us and you may find that we have some good ideas that will help your business so once again draysondesign.com please get in contact i look forward to hearing from you right let's get back and hear more from kerry J. So, so being being a, a, a full time mum, and getting to the point when you know your your children, I'm guessing, were sort of going to nursery and and so forth, you had a bit more time on mm -hmm. your hands, um, and you thought, right, 
let's get back into entertainment. Let's how how did this come about? What did you decide? How did that uh, work? Well, the obvious move was start a dance school. So I thought, well, okay, I'll start a dance school. I'll find a babysitter um, for because um, Dan works a split shift. So one week he's on an early shift, one week he's on a late shift, which means I don't have a consistent time where he'd be able to look after after the kids um so it had to be something i tried finding someone to look after them and it mixed results really and i just i don't think i'm a very good teacher i like you say oh you we want the, the applause i don't want to be telling somebody off and I, you know i don't want to be teaching anybody who doesn't want to be there so i i kind of i did it for a little while but was kind of going through the motions and then somebody just asked me if I could do um a, a party for them so yeah I just came out of that really I did a bit of singing and dancing at a party and it, it just it developed really I um so I, I was running two business it is at the same time as well as I so I say I don't like teaching people I didn't mind teaching adults because they kind of make a decision so what I was also doing is teaching adults wedding dances because um your first wedding dance you're at a lovely stage of your life happy people and it could be done I'd go to their front room and the idea of getting away for two hours to spend in adult company and actually leave the house and room. dancing <laughs> Yeah, dancing and just, yeah, it was fab. So I did that. And as well as dabbling in the parties, um, I went to a wedding fair to try and promote the wedding dance business and saw a balloon twister there. Aha. Uh -huh. mm. So this is your this is your way into <laughs> children's way entertainment. This yeah. was balloon, so balloons was so it I for you? I saw a balloon twister. I was like, oh, that's really cool. I wanted to. So I went home, practiced, and then started selling myself as a balloon twister um which went on for very for a few years and then I've got a very good friend called Louise Clark who I met at a convention called the Blackpool Balloon Bash so mm -hmm. I went to this convention to try and learn some more develop my craft as a balloon twister doing balloons at parties um and she said oh she's come to this other convention tricks in the sticks I'm like, oh, okay and I, it's like a, it's, she's, it's like a children's entertainer convention. Okay, so I, I came along. What she didn't say, it was like it's ninety percent magic, really, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, um, yeah, children's entertainer, but children's magician convention. And I, again, I, would, I didn't know what I didn't know what anybody was talking about. I didn't know what a breakaway wand was. I didn't get half of the gags. Um, Ended up meeting a very nice chap called Gordon. <laughs> we talked that's about weird, Noel Coward. That's my name. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we bonded over Noel Coward, I think, and talked we did. to hours we did. over that. But yeah, I went home. So that was in the July. Uh, no, when was it? It was in the May, I think, that that, that convention happens, Tricks in the Sticks. Yeah. And by July, I'd done my first magic show at. Um, so I just went home and practiced and got the props I was told to. And um, and then from the September, it was it's now a regular part. So that was September before last, so a year and a half ago now. So that's when I started introducing the magic show as a, as a part of my party, which is now my main business. Um, right. So let's let's move yeah. into that, because you do lots of <laughs> you do lots of things. You do uh, bubbles. You do. You do magic, you do your balloons, you've got different themes. So is this, is it a case of people ring you up and say, this is what we want? And you go, yeah, OK, I can do that and then figure it out. Or do you do you do it the other way? Do you, do you think of things that you think will sell and then create those packages, as it were? Um. I used to, for a little while, I used to do the princessing and doing fully costumed characters. So I would have a certain amount of high quality costumes that I would go out as that character. Um, when I first started doing that, people would ask for a princess and you'd put on a beautiful dress and a crown and you could do a princess party. It very soon turned into which princess are you? Um, you know and and people would expect disney parks accurate they would want the perfect wig the perfect 
it yeah. accurate dress, um, which is is limiting. And and I feel if I'm going out as Elsa, um, I want Elsa wouldn't do silly things. She's not. She's a refined princess queen. She's not silly. She wouldn't play silly games. And I felt uncomfortable representing her in that way. I also hated turning up in my car and then them asking how you got there. I meant to turn up in a carriage. It just felt yeah. wrong. And trying to set up a PA in a mermaid tail is just not fun. <laughs> Anybody stretching that. Or that Rapunzel wig trying to... <laughs> I just didn't feel I was providing the best entertainment I could. So, sorry, sorry to interrupt just briefly. Just briefly, you're... You're coming at this from the actor's point of view. You're thinking character, 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 not just putting but on I a dress and turning important. up. No, I yeah, agree. Because, I agree. But yeah. I don't think a lot of other uh, mascot companies, if you want to call them that, do the same thing. They just put the wig and the, the costume on. They go out and they sing, you know, maybe even the wrong song, you know, and it's they're not staying in character. But as a trained actor, you have been taught that this is how certain people react and, and how they behave. And that's why you, I'm guessing, felt wrong doing things that they wouldn't normally do. Yeah. I, you want to answer the children's questions in character, but you also don't want to be lying to them, especially when you can be proved wrong, as in, how did you get here? Yeah. Oh, this is what drove me in this carriage it's like yeah so you get out your, your, your voxel out there it's, and what you don't have yeah. a mclaren what's got a mercedes what's going on <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah so uh, in order to go back to your original question how does the theme fit in i work i i nod to a theme rather than overly theme i have some you know magic tricks that can be adapted to provide the result that fits the theme. So in terms of if it's a card trick, I've got lots of top trump cards or snap cards. I've got Disney princess ones, I've got superhero ones, I've got pirate ones. And then the final results will suddenly produce a magical balloon that is that character, whether, whether it is Elsa or whether it is Spider-Man. Or So that's a sort of trick that, for example, the birthday child will do to produce the result that is that theme. Um, and, you know, things like the magic um, birthday card, colouring card trick, it's always to do with the theme that they've asked for. But yeah. that's the same trick. I'm doing it every party. I mean, uh, you know, within reason. I mix things around because, obviously, if you're doing the same group of kids, you need a little rotation of tricks. Um, but, yeah, I using music that's appropriate to the theme and dressing so um i make a lot of my own dresses so um i i love i love sewing it's the way auntie peggy gave me her a sewing machine and uh, but fabric's expensive and quite often quite boring so i use duvet covers <laughs> so <laughs> i've got like let's i've got a spider-man duvet cover that i've turned into a spider-man print dress a princess dress a unicorn dress but um all of them come out of duvet covers so i've got quite a wardrobe and now you know they're the sort of fitted 50 style fun dress or or some i've got like the pokemon i wear the red cap and a pokemon print t-shirt with sparkly trousers um so i'm i'm putting the effort in to represent their theme, but it's a nod to the theme. I'm not saying I am, you know, Batgirl or whatever. Um, also, I found, so I did, in terms of superhero parties, I used to do Batgirl, wear a mask. You, you're so blocked. I can't interact if I'm not using my eyes and my face. And I find... Um, occasionally I get you asked to bring a Spider-Man mascot along. I've got a couple of chaps that I do use that can be Spider-Man, who are great. I mean, they're gymnasts and they do the whole thing. But a kind of six-foot bloke walking into a four-year-old's party with a mask on is quite scary. Mm. And I think parents don't quite realise that. You, they, they, I've, have, I've given up trying to explain it now because... Oh, my child's fine, and you, they tend to get defensive. And however nicely you put it, but most of the time, when a masked character will walk into a party, children 
it is a scary thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember actually taking my own kids to Blenheim Khaled's to see um, Ben and Holly's Little Kingdom mascots, who were meant to be these teeny tiny elves. And then these seven foot tall kind of. And my kids screamed. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's part of it. Uh, They're a lot bigger yeah. in real life, children. <laughs> <laughs> so you, um, so from what I'm getting from what you just said is that you turn up in lots of different costumes as lots of different characters. Um, no, I always a, a nod me. To, a nod yeah, to. always me, but in a print where they can look at my dress and they say, oh, what can you see on this dress? Oh, I can see Mario and I can see Toad. And what else can you see? And that's a conversation starter as it is. And it looks just like my bed because I've got a duvet <laughs> that looks I like that. I have had that before. <laughs> <laughs> I really like that. Are you, are you marketing yourself as Kerry J or are you marketing yourself as Come To My Party, which is your um, company come name? Come To My Party because, I mean, pre-COVID, I did have uh, about three or four people on the team at one point. I, I, I don't think I could go back to it now because pre-COVID, we were still doing lots of different characters. I was, we were still princessing a bit and offering a mainly dancing games party. Now I've worked on the magic. I've got more expensive props now I'm me and I don't think I would take anybody else on again because I feel the product that I provide is the high quality one that can you know justify the price tag that I'm charging um whereas I I don't want to advertise an not that the other girls were inferior but they they were great at the singing and dancing but they all had different skill sets but I did, but also didn't invest in the same way as I did. It's my company. I've invested in it. I work hard on my routines and my everything. And nobody's going to feel as passionate about your business as you oh, do. No, they never do. So, no. So, and do you uh, find that now you've added the magic to your shows, do you find that um, you get different reactions or do you find that you're just a lot more satisfied with the product that you are offering? What what sort of feedback have you got that since the magic's been added? I think it's a lot more of a professional all round show. I I'm happy with the format. I feel kids. I've always worked in the way that kids will get bored very quickly. So I use a lot of props. Without a new prop, get the parachute out or get the scarves out or get the things. But before we put the scarves away, we can do a little magic trick where the birthday child a change bag thing and suddenly they've got a rainbow and it's. Um, just, oh, I think it just breaks things up. I think, um, it's not everybody sit down for one whole show. It's let's do this and then we're going to do this and then this is going to happen and then this is going to happen. And it's lots of things happening within the two hour party that, that sort of keeps their attention span, which is what you want with four and five year olds. You want to keep their attention I, I mean it's three to kind of nine I suppose is the age group but probably predominantly five six year olds is is what I get booked for five to seven maybe okay uh, but yeah just keeping their attention span by the lots of the different things and I think that's where the magic helps section off the show section off the party and yeah I just feel it's, it's a higher quality product overall so thank you louise for introducing you to tricks in the sticks i know <laughs> she's lovely and, and i have to say actually tricks in the sticks is a great convention there's another one called kidology oh. they're both very yeah. similar in different ways that they're, 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 yeah, they're they both, are very different but they're both they're aimed at children and family entertainers but they do it in a very very different way and um, some people like one and not the other, and some people like both. So I mean, my, my recommendation is if you are a family or children's entertainer in the UK, go to both, and then you can decide Absolutely. which one or both you go to in following years. They are both really good for me. I enjoy all of them. And I think if you take away one, one trick from a convention, it's worth its weight in gold, as in one little tip like... Um, I think it was it Ricky McLeod who did the um like the strike it happy thing with mm -hmm. the emoji. It was, it was a little game really that in the middle mm -hmm. of your magic show you can get everybody standing on their feet to play a game and sit down. It takes 
a, a few minutes um, of just getting everybody to be a volunteer and, and on their feet rather than just sitting down. And that was the trick that I got from Kidology that was worth its weight in gold. That was worth the price of the convention for me because it was yeah. – and seeing people as well, that's the other thing, seeing yeah. seeing people, connecting with people because meeting such brilliant people that now count as friends um, – but also that you can bounce off. You're having trouble with this trick, this business situation, this uh, just having people that understand where you're coming from and you can talk to as a peer because we don't have that water cooler mo moment on a Monday morning, do we? Where we, oh, how was your weekend? What well, has your day been? How's your week been? And it, you need people like yourself <laughs> um, and but like all the people that we meet at these conventions that know exactly where we're coming from and don't think you're being precocious because you're you're saying something that's a bit flamboyant or just people who get and, you and also nice. someone to to ride the highs with you when you come away from a gig and you've you, you feel like it's been like a really good gig you know, telling your other half, they go, oh, that's nice, dear. You know, I'm glad you had a yeah. good day. But if you if you talk to another entertainer or someone who's who's got the knowledge of it, that they'll they'll be able to understand and and celebrate with you. Um, and that's one of the reasons I started this podcast is is to bring people together like that. Um, and if you haven't already, please join the Facebook page. Uh, it's uh, Family and Children's Entertainers. And uh, you can you can meet like minded people and we can use that as a water cooler uh, sort of time if you want to, to talk to someone or just, you know, put something on there about how happy you are about something that you tried and it went really well. Uh, it's a really it's a really good place to do that. That's that's one of the aims of this podcast. And um, your your show sounds like it's going from one thing to the other to the other, doing magic, then a game, and then parachute and everything else. Is this something that you have a an order for, or do you pick and yeah. choose depending on the group of children, or how does it work for you? Um, I have a very set format. I, it sounds flaky, flighty, but it is quite structured. So um, I I offer a hand. So the first 15 minutes as children arrive, I give them all a hand stamp, um, like a little ink stamp. And it's a way parents will say, I want to get a face paid and, uh, and, and I, I don't want to be losing them, the children. I want their attention. I don't want their attention somewhere else. I want their attention with me. And this is a way to give them something physical on their body for those who want it, which is a tiny little ink stamp, which again, I will theme to fit the party. Um, so um, that's a way I would play music. And it's a way of gently introducing yourself to maybe that shy four-year-old who doesn't really want to join in and doesn't want to say hello. But would you like a tiny little Spider-Man stamp on your arm? Oh, oh, okay. Well, maybe. So then you're drawing them in. So that's because you, you know, as you know, you don't want to. You can't. If the party start time is three o'clock, you can't launch into your show at three o'clock. You have to have that buffer. So that's my little fifteen minute buffer. Um, there's then forty five minutes of dancing and games um, where I do use lots of props and I'll maybe slip in a tiny magic trick in, but it will be. It will be mainly music and games. Then I will pass over to the parents for the food while I set up. So I would then pack away that side of things, the props, and set up for a magic show. And then the children will sit down and it will be a very, you know, a 40-minute magic show. That we will all end up dancing a very last thing, you know, birthday child gets a prize, everybody else, I'll, I'll give them all a balloon sword at the end. So that's, again, something I'll prep in the 15-minute food break. We'll get the balloon swords done. The, then we'll pop the bubbles with the balloon swords. And, you know, so the, it is chaos. If the parents picking up, they just must think, <laughs> you know, oh God, what a chaotic party. But it is very structured. Um, and if they've arrived a little bit sooner, they'll see a bit more of a proper structured show but no it uh, yeah the way i've described it previously sounds chaotic but it has got a very definite structure I, that... knowing what i do about you i figured that would be the case but um i, I mean it, it's it's like it's like acting though isn't it to make sure that it appears like it's the first yeah. time this has ever happened oh, so yeah. grabbing the, the the handkerchiefs and 
you know, oh, hey, I tell you what we could do. We could change them into a rainbow. It's like <laughs> the first time that's ever happened. But you've got to be able to act that and make it look like it's the first time, yeah. not not as I call it Groundhog Day magic, where you look like you've done it many, many times, and it just looks like it. That's the yeah. that's the that's the the yeah. You never want to look tired. You'd no, say. I want to stop before I get to that point. If I ever get to, if you ever see me perform and I look like that, please come and tell me because uh, sometimes <laughs> we don't recognise it ourselves. I've got a question for you that I think you're going to have trouble answering. Um, so as a female performer, you probably get a very different sort of um, inquiry to to me as a, as a male performer. Do you, do you find that you get inquiries from people saying it's so nice to see a lady doing this because there aren't many of them or do you do you find they come to you because they think you're more of a mother type figure being a mother yourself um do, do you do you get any sort of feedback for that i'm i don't quite know how this question is is supposed to be worded i'm, I'm trying really really hard not to not to sound it's sexist in any way but it's yeah. it's something that i think is subconsciously happening and I don't know if it's something that you've picked up on I don't think quite so much in terms of children's entertainment because um, I think there's a lot of general children's entertainers who are female there's a lot uh, more now definitely yeah. there, there's, they, they, they seem to be coming into children's entertainment more than they do any other type of entertainment, like like close up magic, for example, there's not as many close up no, no, female I, I think, magicians. And, and for example, we're going to the Blackpool Magic Convention um, in a couple of weeks. It was my first time there last year, and I remember walking into so there's the pub, the Ruskin, that everybody hangs out in. How many does it hold? About five hundred people, probably. Oh, it's doesn't? huge. Yeah, it's, it's huge. massive. It is ninety nine point eight percent male in there. Yeah. And every single person has got a pack of cards in their back pocket and wants to show you something. <laughs> for, for those who don't know, Blackpool Magic Convention is the biggest magic convention in the world. Um, there's about, I think there's about four and a half thousand people who go every year now. And it is, in historically, it's been very much aimed at sort of the close-up performer. Because I'm guessing that's what the hobbyists do. They pick up close-up tricks to show their friends. Um yeah. Luckily, we've got Russ Brown, who is a children's entertainer, a family entertainer, um, who's very, very good uh, in Blackpool, who's now on the committee. And he's been pushing for more and more children's entertainers uh, events. You know, the competition is is there. They've got the um, the lectures. Um, we had Mario Maker last year, who was very much children and family orientated. And, and so it is it is widening. And I think because of that, it's attracting more children and family entertainers like yourself um yeah. but yeah i found definitely that there's a lot more female entertainers coming into this side of it than there is coming into another type of magic i i think the other type of magic to be a good um for example wedding close-up magician is very very skillful um is, and, and there are some very good you know female close-up magicians of not as nowhere near as many as men i don't know maybe it's a time thing uh, a hobbyist would more likely to be male for some reason i don't know why um i'd love to be able to do it i'm certainly not skilled enough i i've come into magic learning self easy tricks and then slowly developing odd skills but i'm the the other thing is um so my next door neighbour um, wanted to hire a magician for her office Christmas party. Um, I put her onto my magic club um, because my, my local magic club and she hired one of the guys from there, which was great. She, I wouldn't have considered doing it. She said there, there are a load of, um, it, it's a construction company. Um, it's, um, she it said, a tough crowd. And there was a, yeah. a massive complaint last year because one of the, blokes grabbed one of the singing waitresses ass and you know i i i think i would have felt slightly awkward in that situation doing close-up magic i you would have had comments no matter what you'd have worn or there, there's situation and where there's a lot of drunk people you need to be a very witty um <sighs> 
just I, I don't think I'm quite strong enough to deal with drunk men making close up propositions. I can probably deal with it on a stage and whereas there, there's the barrier. But in terms of close up, I think I it takes a great deal of skill. And there's definitely people who have that sort of skill, but I don't think I'm one of them. So um, I need so to they, I need to uh, just clarify something you said there. Skill as in technical skill and skill both, and experience both. in that situation. Yeah, I, I think I feel experience that... in that situation is definitely a, a, yeah. a, able to fend off, you know, drunk men making <laughs> inappropriate. Yes. Um, because I think family and children's entertainers also require a lot of skill. I, I oh, can, they do, completely. Yeah. I, I would love to see some of these close-up performers doing a children's party and in fact oh, i've yeah. spoken to many of them and they say oh i don't know how you do it i would it's not even something i would consider which is yeah. exactly what you're saying but that's because they haven't got the skills and the experience to know what to do and how to do it so yeah. i think children's entertaining and family entertaining is very very skillful uh, and and we're learning all the time and i i feel that what again one of the reasons i i set this up is that we are the entertainers who probably do more gigs than the other entertainers you know yeah. stage I mean, performers a wedding you would do on a one saturday night wouldn't you probably yeah. whereas we're always four shows a week but uh, four yeah. shows a weekend because you do a morning party and an afternoon party on a saturday or sunday yeah uh, so yeah I, I i think also though it's a different skill set so i'm i'm stage i'm magic i'm you know tada where's my applause i think and it's just it so actors you will get the wonderful shakespearean fabulous actors which are very different to eastenders kind of uh, you know yes some people can do both and some people could do both brilliantly but a lot of tv actors aren't good on the stage and a lot of stage actors aren't good on yeah. tv it's the same i a close-up something subtle something jokey jokey close-up is completely different to you know, here I am, this is this magical event and come with me on this journey. And it's it's something completely different. different and getting skills. it right in one take as well, which you need to do on the stage. Whereas, exactly. you know, yeah. film TV. <laughs> oh, that exactly. was rubbish. Let's do another one. You need to be perfect eight shows a week. <laughs> yeah. And that takes a lot of work. That takes yeah. a lot of work. Yeah. Um, so, um you have the greatest showman circus party did you did you learn circus skills for this as well so circus has been if you'd have asked little kerry age eight what she wanted to be when she grew up trapeze artist wow just oh, that the circus has been my my passion i mean i'm looking on my wall over there i've got posters from circuses and i i, I love the circus and uh, I I always wanted to run away to join that red or the Noel Streckfield circus book, so that, you know, the Enid Blyton ones and the, you know, I, that that's something I loved. So, um, and I can't really do it. I, I, wait, I did trapeze for a while. A few years ago, there was a circus school around here and I, I did a trapeze um, course there, which was fantastic fun. But, um, yeah, um, but I can't juggle. I mean, I can juggle three balls. I can't do anything more exciting than three balls. Um, <laughs> said the actress to the bishop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, PG, PG. Okay. okay sorry. Um, <laughs> But I, you know, I, so basically it's uh, the greatest, show. I, I was thinking about doing circus workshops. And, well, it, it, I started doing festivals. So actually, uh, this is going to hark back to your previous question. Have I ever been booked because I was female? The very, um, I, uh, festivals is the one instance where as um, I'm being booked, hopefully this year, I'm having discussions um, with somebody I've done a lot of festivals before. And he says, one of the key things about me is that he knows lots of male magicians who can come and put on a show. Um, he knows lots of female face painters and lots of female other things. But to put on a show, that is my niche. And that's why he particularly wants me on this festival, because I am female. He didn't quite put it like that. He put it very subtly. But yes, I think later in this year, if I am booked with it, hopefully I will be on this job one of the key factors will be because I am different from other people because I am female. It's one of your um, unique selling so, propositions, yeah. isn't it? 
yeah, I guess it just pre presents a different way of looking at things. But going back to that, working with these festivals in the past, which I've done, um, that's uh, watching the circus workshops on there. I've loved joining in and having a go. My son um, learned to unicycle at one of these festivals. Um, and he, you know, going back year after year and he's got a unicycle himself now. And so um, I, I've, I love the circus. So I've got, I basically, I've got a load of circus equipment that is easy for kids to do that I can demonstrate easily. Um, and we do the whole party. We do the first half as a workshop um, where they I demonstrate all the different things, how to use stilts, because a lot of people hold stilts like that and try and stand yeah. them, keep yeah. them close to your body. Um, uh, diabolos and, uh, you know, little ribbons and just lots of little things really like that. So we'll just, we'll demonstrate it. They'll go, let rip. Watching dads trying to spin a plate is brilliant. I try and get <laughs> mum's joined in and trying to get them to spin plates. So that's she makes it look so easy. <laughs> um, so yeah, doing all that, and then I but I still keep the structure. I don't, I only want that to happen for about 45 minutes tops. Pass the food, pack all the kit away, either do a magic show usually then, or do some dancing and games. Or if they want to keep it free flow and put a bouncy castle up or something, I'll do balloon modelling. Um, but um, I don't know about it. I mean, I don't want to do anything. We, you know, we never want a bouncy castle up or something while we're entertaining. So if that's happening, I always just do something that can work in the background, like balloon modelling, rather than. I bought like myself a remote control plug, and if there's ever a bouncy castle in the room. I will go and take the plug out of the bouncy castle, put my socket in and then plug it back in again. So just for a fraction of a second, it's off and then it's back on again. And then when we start the show, without telling anyone, I say, right, oh, gosh, bouncy castle is really noisy, isn't it? Um, tell you what, everyone wiggle your fingers at the bouncy castle. And as they do, it just goes... Which is, which is just great. <laughs> I love it. It's so very magical. Kids still on it. <laughs> yeah, well, I do make sure they're off. Yeah. Oh, that's but, brilliant. I love it. But it's a great way to do some magic, but also get rid of the distraction and the noise yeah. because they can be really, really noisy. Yeah. Sounds yeah. like you needed to have done Barnum at some point. Oh, I love. Oh, I love that show. I I would have loved to have done that show. That that is my dream show. <laughs> my double act partner, uh, Paul Longhurst, who we'll have on this um, uh, show one time. Uh, he. You not was... been on already? No, he hasn't. No. Well, I didn't want to. I didn't want to show favoritism. You know. <laughs> um, but he he was in Barnum, and oh, uh, he took he took the part of P.G. Barnum, and um, yeah, the the tightrope walking was. If you ever see Paul Longhurst. Go up to him and say, how's your tightrope walking? And he'll tell you the story of it. I shall say no more. I shall oh, leave that to him. I'm definitely going to ask that. <laughs> but yes. Uh, so just to sort of wrap up the time that we have with you, um, can I thank you, first of all, for for spending time with us and, and telling us about your journey? Because it's, it's a very different journey to most of the children's entertainers and family entertainers that we, we come across. They are... Um, sort of hooked at the age of three or something and then they just learn magic 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 and they don't learn all of the theatrical skills that you need to be able to work on a stage or you know in a festival you're quite often on a huge stage with you know thousands of people and you've got to make sure that the show that you put provide for them is going to be suitable for that venue um, you know and sometimes you know run rabbit run isn't going to cut it because it's just it's just you know it's it's here rather than out here somewhere. Um, I've so, done the old um, climbing balloon a few times at festivals. <laughs> I bet that goes down well. One. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine. Hopefully you don't want them inside it. <laughs> <laughs> so last question for you then, Kerry. Um, yeah. Before I let you go, and uh, you've probably got a school run coming up knowing you. Yep. Yep, there we go. Okay. <laughs> uh, so... Um, where, where is Kerry J going? What's the next big adventure? What's what's going to happen in the next few years? Oh my gosh, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I I'd, I'd love to get back into 
um singing a little bit more again maybe doing some gigs for fun with that or bringing it back in i don't know i don't know i'd like to go back and do i like the idea of cruise ships again but as a just let's go on a two-week cruise and do it i guess but then I yeah very much going to be at least five years down the line when my 13 year old's a bit older um but i do like the idea of going to do more things like that so I don't know. See, I everything, guys. Just I never know. I, you asked me two years ago. You'd have told me two years ago. I'd have been a magician. I'd have laughed at you. Um, I, I don't know. My my whole thing always has been just say yes to everything. Can you do this? Yes. Can you do this? Yes. Um, uh, you know, I, I think you just take an opportunity where you see it and if you don't know it's that old thing on on people the actors can you ride a horse yes of course I can you figure if you get the job you'll take a horse riding lesson it's if something sounds appealing can you do it yes of course I can <laughs> so I think I'll just see what opportunities come along really well, um, I wish you all the best in the future um, you. if you want to find out more about uh, Kerry, how, how do they go about that? They've got you've got your website, Come to My Party, where you you have yeah. your children's entertainment. Do you have any other social media that you um, you promote things um, with? No, I'm not so good on that. I, I did have a website, KerryJ.com, which is probably hopelessly out of date that I haven't actually looked at for about ten years. So probably don't look at that. Edit that out. It's a bit late now. You've just said it. Uh, <laughs> Everyone's going to be doing. I, I haven't looked at that for years, so I, I, it's one that's been ticking along in the background that I haven't looked at. I've, yeah, there's various videos on YouTube and things, but. Um, well, if you see know. Kerry at Tricks in the Sticks or Kidology or Blackpool or, or the Balloon Bash, please go and say hello because um, she's she's such a lovely person and she will give you this really big smile that she has and she is so knowledgeable. She's so talented. Um, <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for spending time with us, Kerry. And oh, um, really I'm fun. looking forward to seeing you in Blackpool. Yes, can't wait to hang out. <laughs> Great, thank you, Kerry. So that was Kerry J, a a very interesting person and a lovely lady to boot. She's got such a lot of experience by working in the West End on proper shows. I say the word proper shows, but you know what I mean. We all do proper shows. But these shows are shows where people are actually paying top price in the West End uh, to go and see these particular shows and they've got to be good you, there's no second chances there's no oh I'm sorry I forgot to bring something it's got to be a hundred percent good and accurate and professional eight times a week eight shows a week now there's a lot of people who do this and you know after a short while they get very bored of it and they they can't show that as a professional they need to make sure that they give as much energy to the first show of the week as they do to the last show of the week and six months later down the line they have to do it exactly the same each time. We are lucky in some respects in the fact that because we control our own shows we can do what we want with our show if we want to throw something new into it well we can do so just as long as we make sure it's of good enough quality uh, there's a conversation for another time. What do you take out to put something new in? I've got some very interesting views on that. I'll talk about that in the future. Uh, Kerry J though, uh, she, she did the course. She went through college. She got the job. She did the interviews. She landed the roles and she put in all the hard work that was needed to get to the point of being a West End star. And then children came along and she changed tact. She changed from being uh, someone who works every night on a show to someone that you could hire to go to their party. So a very different route into children and family entertainment, but nonetheless valid. And in fact, probably she's learnt the performance skills way before the entertainment of children skills. And because uh, of her knowledge, 
just getting a few tricks and practicing and practicing and practicing them allowed her to become a, a magician, a children's entertainer very quickly. One of the things that Kerry spoke about, which I found very interesting, is when she was going out as a princess and she would be sort of one of the Disney princesses and felt that she was not giving her all to that character because she wasn't actually acting in the same way that that character is expected to act. Uh, you know, she was talking about Elsa from Frozen and how Elsa would, would not arrive in a car. She would arrive in a carriage, definitely. She would have footmen around her. She was talking about how the princess wouldn't play silly games because she's a very refined princess. And this, this created a problem for Kerry because she couldn't give the character 100%. And I really hadn't thought of it this way. When these mascots companies go out as their characters, not only are they supposed to be that character, they're supposed to act and think like that character as well. And a lot of these characters that I see don't do that. In fact, a lot of the characters don't sing. They don't act the way they should. If they do sing, they maybe just sing in a, in a different song completely. They might have a little you know, CD player or something along that, an MP3 player. And would, would the princess, would she actually have one of those or would she, would she do it in a different way? I found that very, very interesting. And it just goes to show how being an actor and being trained as an actor gives you a completely different outlook to how these characters should be played. And because she wasn't able to do what she wants to do as an actor, she's now tipping a nod to the theme rather than saying that she is these characters. And I think that's a really sensible way of doing that. It also allows her to be as flexible as possible. She can add a new character or a new theme, I should say, into her shows very easily uh, and just sort of theme a little bit about uh, what she does and how she does it rather than being a brand new character. Kerry is such a lovely person. If you do see her at any convention, please go and say hi. She is very bubbly, she's very smiley, and she's got this sort of light up the room type smile that she has. So do go and say hello. I know she'd love to speak to you. She's very sociable. And I would like to thank her once again for spending time with me, talking about her career to this point. And hopefully, at some point in the future, we'll go back and we'll find out where Kerry J is now, what twists and turns her career has taken, and what she's doing at that point. If you haven't already, please like, share and subscribe on YouTube, on the website facethepodcast.com, or on your podcast platform wherever you get your podcasts. Every feedback, every comment, every like really helps me. Uh, I don't do this for the money. Uh, I do this because I feel it's right and something we should have uh, for the family and the children's entertainers. And it's the sort of thing that will spur me on once I get feedback to hear that you are actually enjoying these episodes. And every episode takes me about a week or so to do, which is why they don't come out as often as maybe I would like them to. But I have to fit them in around all my other work. So the more feedback I get, the more impetus I'll have behind me to get a new episode out. Once again, that's the website is facethepodcast.com and you'll be able to see all of the episodes up there or listen to them on your favourite podcast platform. Until the next episode, my name is Gordon Drayson and it's been a pleasure to be your host for this episode. And I look forward to speaking with you in real life. If you see me, come and say hello uh, on the Facebook page that we have, uh, which is Family and Children's Entertainers in real life, or maybe just have you listen to the next episode. Until then, my name's Gordon Drayson, and I will uh, look forward to you joining me next time on Face the Podcast. Until then, goodbye. Thank you.